This is the Distinctly Detroit Podcast, the only pod that explores why one wants to be in the D. I am your host, Fiota Ship III, the director of the University of Michigan Detroit Center. Join me as I interview students, scholars, leaders, and innovators about living, working, and loving in Detroit. back to the Distinctly Detroit podcast. I'm Fiona Ship, your host, and today's guest is uh, today's guest is the author of the recently published The Candy Girl Mentality: Keys to Turning Bitter Moments into Sweet Success. She has served as a Michigan House of Representative uh, and she has also served as the chief of staff for the city of Detroit's Mayor Duggan and she was the first vice president for Detroit campuses for Davenport University. She is now an author and entrepreneur and my former classmate. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Lisa Howes. Welcome, Lisa Howes. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate Appreciate having you on. Yes. Thank you very much for coming on to the Distinctly Detroit podcast and making time for us. We know you got a lot going on uh, with this book. I've been seeing you and your social media doing radio shows and things of that nature. So we appreciate you gracing our small stage here. And uh, we're just going to start off with some things. Uh, Where are you from originally? So first of all, let me just say that being here at the University of Michigan, uh, Detroit Center, you know, is like being home, but a little bit away from home. Because, you know, we we attended school in Ann Arbor, right? The big house. Um, And so I'm pretty excited about the opportunity to come here to connect with you again and to talk about my new book, uh, Candy Girl Mentality. Yeah, cool. Oh, we're glad to have you. And uh, where, so where'd you grow up again? So I grew up on the northwest side of Detroit, primarily west side and then northwest side. Went to uh, about five elementary schools before I reached fifth grade, or by the time I reached fifth grade. Um, but graduated from Quarry uh, Elementary, then went on to uh, Servany Middle School prior okay. to starting at the Cass Technical High School, the second to none. Cass Technical. <laughs> Just won a first boys state championship in basketball. Yeah. Wow. That is history cool. for us, and Great that's a school. good history, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Uh, so you you went to Cass. Uh, you went to uh, grew up on the west side of Detroit. What made you attend the University of Michigan? Well, actually, I applied to U of M um, during my senior year, and to be honest, U of M was not my first choice. Um, if I had my druthers, and I do talk about this in chapter four to the book called Go Blue, Lessons Outside of the Classroom. But if I had my druthers, I would have gone to an HBCU, okay. um, preferably uh, FAMU or North Carolina at and um, Not to promote those schools, but just to emphasize the importance of first impressions. Those were the first um, colleges that came to speak to me in my classes at CAS. And I was very impressionable and impressed yeah. at the same time. So it was like, that's where I wanted to go. But my mom and my <laughs> uncle had a different idea, right? Yeah. So I did participate in um, On the Spot Admission, uh, still not with U of M, because at the time, if you recall, there were um, some unrest on the campuses of U of M in Ann Arbor. There were um, the Black Student Union. You know, They had protests. They had sit-ins there was a lot of racial tension on the campus at U of M and some of our other universities, our PWIs uh, here in the state. However, um, it turned out that uh, I did apply in the end um, and I got accepted. And it was a choice between Ann Arbor and that other school in East Lansing. And whenever I asked- um, There's a school in East Lansing? The other one, you know. (laughs) Ex-brand, okay. ex-brand. They don't okay. have a name. All right. uh, just kidding, guys. But nevertheless, um, I asked, where should I go? And hands down, 100% of the time, people said U of M. And as a result, I said, I guess I'm going to U of M. And uh, I'm so glad that I made that decision. Not only was it the best choice, you know, going to one of the top 10 st- schools and business schools in the nation. Um, The Ross School of Business is where I graduated in 1995 and got my degree uh, in accounting. Um, But it also allowed me to form, you know, long lasting relationships and uh, to live out a legacy 
um, that is known and recognized throughout the world. So there's nothing like, you know, being able to say, go blue. Yeah, no, nothing at all. Because if I recall correctly, though, you were a pretty snazzy dresser in high school. You dressed, you like kind of dressed very business-like. So I could have saw you at FAMU, too. I understand <laughs> they required the students to dress up business attire down there oh, yeah. all the time. You'd have fit right in. Well, you know, I credit that to me being in the business curriculum at CAS, um, participating in programs like uh, Business Professionals of America. Mm. So it was kind of in eight in terms of how I was being molded and um, uh, prepared for what was my what my future would become. Um, so I'm I'm grateful again for even the programs that they had at CAS, uh, allowing me to participate in the internship um, for one of our local banks. Uh, and so I've gotten some early exposure that has allowed me to be able to you know once I graduated to step into that professional setting and already have the discipline and the kind of posture that's necessary to be able to succeed uh, in a corporate corporate environment. Yeah, and that's, that, that's, that your poise has always shown through. And that's one thing, so one of, you were very popular at CAS, uh, very well known, and why was that? Well, there was this, um, this thing that I did, I used to carry this like <laughs> sack on my shoulder that was full of candy. <laughs> Chips, pop, and drink boxes, right? Yes. But it didn't start there. So okay. where it starts, so let me just clear things up. So I was the candy girl. The one, the only candy yes. girl. There were those who tried to imitate and perpetrate. But could not duplicate. They could not at yeah. all, right? So um, so here's what happened. In my 10th grade year, when you joined us at yeah. CAS. You um, did this in my honor, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I said, Fiona's is here. <laughs> I got to supply him with what he needs, yeah. right? Yeah. So I got exposed to junior achievement. So again, going back to exposure, exposure for kids um, helps to create, create uh, awareness and build interest and a desire to do something that they may never have known was possible. Mm -hmm. So junior achievement did that for me. Um, we had a project to sell M&M candies. And for me, uh, it inspired me to take a $13 investment in M&Ms and what happened is I turned it into more than $4,000 by the time I graduated, which helped to pay for my first semester at the University of Michigan. Now, when I tell that story to some of our classmates today, they kind of do like you did, go, wow, Lisa, I didn't know you were making that kind of money. I honestly thought you would have made more. But, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, here's the interesting You were slinging candy like crack. You know, you hey, <laughs> we are not. And I'm talking doing... about the lines. I'm talking about the lines of people. And, uh, people chasing her down in hall. She's late to class a lot. People yeah. trying to get that candy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's why. That's no. a true statement. But, yeah. you know, we want to make sure that we're very clear. No, she was about not selling crack. No, what, right about what was being transacted yes. in the hallways and in the back. just candy. It's just, just, All just. All above board, legitimate <laughs> transactions. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that um, there weren't people in administration who wanted to not have me yeah. um, participate in such activity. In They're fact, haters, so I right. remember a time I was in my uh, one of my business courses and there was an announcement that came over the PA system mm -hmm. and it said, um, while we appreciate your entrepreneurial endeavors, <laughs> we ask that you cease and desist from all sales in and around school property. So I said, hmm, sounds like they might be talking to me. But that announcement went in one ear and, and right on the other, right? Yeah. So I even had teachers who, you know, had their candy favorites, whether it was a Snickers or a Kit Kat or Twix or what have you. And I'd make sure that I'd supply them with what they needed. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact of the matter is um, entrepreneurship is something I know we kind of joke about it in that sense and whether or not, um, you know, it was appropriate to do that on school property. But the fact of the matter is when you give a kid an opportunity to earn money, honestly, right, um, it opens up a world of possibility to them. It's like, again, I've done the things that I've done, not just to say, look at what Lisa has done but really to demonstrate of what's possible for others, right? And so that entrepreneurial spirit has just been a part of who I am for a very long time. And even in the work environments uh, that I've, you know, been work, have worked in and in leadership roles, it kind of 
requires you to be creative and be innovative to solve problems and things of that nature. And so when we talk about the candy girl mentality, it's not just about, you know, this kid who who took $13 and doubled it like five times um, in one week where by the end of that week, it was $416 that I had, you know what I mean? So um, for a 15-year-old, like that's huge, right? Um, But think about- And I'm also very impressed with your ability to save it. Because for me, I mean, me, I'm earning that money. I, I'm going to blow it thinking I'm going to earn more and back no problem. So exactly. the fact that you saved it is well, also very important. Let me tell you where that really comes into play in terms of its importance. Yeah. Okay, so we mentioned that I went to the University of Michigan along mm-hmm. with yourself, right? Well, I completed my financial aid papers on behalf of my mom, right? It asked me, or the question was, do you have savings? And I said, well, yes, I do. <laughs> and I filled in the paperwork. My mom signed off on it and we submitted it. Well, due to my honesty and due to my pride in like, yeah, you know, I got this money, right? Well, the University of Michigan sent me a nice fat tuition uh, bill for $4,000. So you got savings? We want all of that. We want every dime. <laughs> exactly. So when I talk about how I took $13 and turned it into more than $4,000 to help pay for my tuition at U of M, it's because of that fact. Now, to your point about saving the money, imagine if over the summer before starting at U of M in the fall, yeah. I had blew it all. You know, I had gone to the mall. I'd done some shopping, what have you. Yeah. I may not have had it, but the fortunate thing is I did have it, and I was able to cut the check. It hurt. It was painful, but I'm glad I had it as opposed to not. But I think that put, for a lot of kids who don't get as someone who didn't appreciate the blessings and the grace that was given to me in my youth, I think the fact that you helped, that you put money on that first semester out of your own pocket gave you so much skin in the game. Oh, yes. That that's an extra motivation. I'm paying for it. It's not just mom and dad. It's not just the government giving me financial aid, but I'm putting in on this. So that gave you extra drive. Because it took, you know, you worked for that money. So Absolutely, that's- I did. And the crazy thing is, too, um, I didn't know, like, I didn't get the memo back then that I was considered a first generation college student. Yeah. And there's a certain, um, having worked in higher education, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that, more familiar with it now. Um, there's a certain stigma that's attached to students who are first gen. Yeah. One, they come from communities where, um, you know, minority communities, black, brown uh, individuals, BIPOC communities, right? Um, a poor, low income. Uh, but then the, the, the one thing that stood out to me that I said, wait, hold up, is when it said uh, a lower likelihood of graduation. I said, oh no, I'm glad I didn't get that memo because when I stepped foot onto the campus at U of M, I was determined to graduate in four years. So much so that I took 16 credits my first semester. Now they told me not to. They said only take like three classes, 12 semesters. I was like, no, because I'm getting out of here in four. So give me my 16, right? Um, But I was committed to that and I was committed to getting into the business school. So I think whatever you do, you need to go into it with a mindset that um, this is what I want to accomplish coming out. And therefore, everything that I did, and it wasn't easy, but everything that I did was with that goal in mind. Um, And so I'm all the better for it. Yeah, most definitely. So yeah, talking, continuing your journey, you went to U of M, you went... You went to the U of M B school, as we called it back then, That's before it became the Ross School of exactly. Business. Uh, you got a degree in accounting. Uh, you went on to work in corporate America as a certified. You got a CPA, right? Yeah. So I went into yep. Yeah, I went into public accounting, working for then uh, it was the big five. Well, it was big six when I graduated, but uh, Arthur Anderson. Okay. Um, which is no longer yeah, around. Yeah, they changed their name. Right. Of the stuff. Yeah, yeah, they not only changed their name, they went out of existence. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. the only part that remained from um, that Arthur Anderson family was the consulting side okay. of the business. Um, and so that has since evolved into a different name, which you may be referring to. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I was an auditor. Um, and in fact, one of my clients was the city of Detroit. Um, and you talk about how life, you know, goes full circle 
how did I know that when I was auditing uh, the grants programs for the city of Detroit, which ensures that monies that come from the feds and the state are appropriately used, right, in order for them to, you know, continue to receive those funds, um, that I would later be working for the city yeah. um, and, uh, you know, feeling the effects of when those pro those monies weren't necessarily managed as well, you know, some of those uh, departments actually went away as a result of it. So it's just kind of things that I reflect on, you know, as I move throughout my career, mm -hmm. where I began and kind of like um, what's happened on the back end in, in terms of that, you know, completing the full circle. So Yeah, well, that's one of the, things, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on the show because I think your journey is fascinating. And I think it's also a great testament to young people out there about, being versatile, being adaptable, being nimble. And you set yourself up very well with that accounting degree. Because I tell you all this time offline, like, I, you know, you can do anything. Once you're good with numbers, you can kind of go anywhere. But you started off in corporate America. What prompted you to go into public service? Ooh, okay. So um, first of all, we're coming up on 17 years since I left corporate America. Yeah. Like, I quit my job, right? Yeah. And it was a good job. Yep. Um, and they were a great company in terms of how well they treated me and supported me in my endeavors, both, I'll say, outside of work, um, you know, leading the National Association of Black Accountants as its chapter president for four years, um, serving in that role when we hosted the national convention in the city of Detroit in 2005. Um, you know, just kind of being with me uh, over the course of my journey, I, I thank them for that. Um, however, <clears throat> there was always something within me that said, um, there has to be something greater than this. Like, what is it that impassions me? What is it that moves me? And one of the things that I've always enjoyed doing is speaking and pouring into the lives of other people. And so um, not knowing that when I left in July of 2006 to do that, that the economy would be in an upheaval and you know, there would be a time where I started to feel like, wait a minute, I didn't know that I'd be in the eye of the storm. You know, I kind of reflect on that in the book and, and saying that, um, you know, I didn't see any of this coming. But the reality is I reached a point where um, I learned, I said this, although things may be hard, one thing that I cannot do is give up. And so when you turn the page, you see me being sworn in to the state house as a state representative. And where that all began is uh, I get a phone call in January of 2009 from a friend suggesting that I run for Detroit City Council. And to be honest, my response to him was, are you crazy? <laughs> I'm not doing that. Like, when would I have time to run for public office? But he insisted that um, the time was such that the city needed me. And it's one of those things that I don't know if you've ever felt this way before, but if you've ever felt like um, like this weight is on your shoulder and there's something you have to give, you're just not sure if you're ready and willing to give it. Well, that's how I felt in that moment. And I sat back and I pondered it. I talked to some other people. Most everyone said, Lisa, do it, including my mom, my dad, excuse me. And my stepmom, they were like, we'll vote for you, we'll vote for you twice, right? And so I went home and I prayed about it uh, that following morning. And I said, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, so I, I ran that race. Uh, there were 168 candidates in the race. Uh, I was the only certified public accountant in the race. And that was my mantra. Uh, so people began to, to know me um, by that, you know as I would encounter them, you know, they would, other candidates would know who I was before I had even introduced myself. And the reason being is um, I invested in radio ads early in the campaign, like before many other candidates ran ads, that was one way of me getting my message out. And as a result, it helped to pay off to the extent that 48,000 people voted for me in the general election. Now, it was still a few votes short. I came in 10th place, um, one seat away from being elected. But again, it's like when you talk about the candy girl mentality, it's like, okay, how do you take this setback and bounce back from it? And what ended up happening is 
the, the things that I did to run in 2009 set me up for the real run in 2010 for state representative, yeah. and that's the office that I want. That's cool. And that's, again, I think that, you know, that experience, it also gave you exposure. It got your name out there. You're able to help shape the narrative and the discussion around the campaign overall mm -hmm. for city council. So people, they had probably adapted some of your viewpoints and positions to help, you know, move their own candidacy forward. We we'll just <laughs> leave it down. The book just <laughs> wants to drop off. But, so uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm all about like transparency, right? So what you guys hear falling is the book. Right. It was propped up. This is Candy Girl Mentality book. Uh, so we're just going to lay it right here. Uh, <laughs> you can do this when you know each other. Right. Well. Right. Yeah, I'm so, on your show, but you yeah, know, it's, cool. it's all good. <laughs> well, uh, OK, so you then you ran for you. You got into the state house. Uh, and what was that experience like? It was it was difficult. Right. And the reason why I say that is because we were coming into a time where uh, I served in the Democratic Party, so we were in the minority. Like in the House, there's 110 members. There were 67 Republican members and only 43 Democratic members. So I think it was 63, 47. Those were the numbers, 63 yeah. and 47. And so, um, you know, we uh, just had to kind of sit back and take it a lot of times. And, and as much of, of a fight we could put up, you know, it was still very much limited because we just simply didn't have the votes. However, what that experience allowed me to do is to develop relationships with um, lawmakers, um, members of the, the governor's team, um, members of leadership within both parties. Um, and so that experience and those relationships that I developed later helped me when I'm serving for the mayor in the capacity of a chief government affairs officer getting a number of key policy issues passed on behalf of the city uh, because of those relationships and understanding how that process works. So again, there's, there's never anything lost. Um, I think there's always an opportunity to gain. Yeah. The key is to be able to, to have that perspective and understand that, okay, this may not be the ideal situation, but what can I take from it and turn it to my advantage. And that's what I've been able to successfully do. And that's what I'm teaching others to do uh, through the book, Candy Girl Mentality. So you served in the state house, mm -hmm. got, gave the good fight yes. on behalf of the Republicans. Uh, Not on behalf of I mean, the I'm Republicans. sorry, on behalf of the Democrats. I'm probably against the, the Republicans. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, let's, let's get that right. Uh, then you ended up working for the mayor of the city of Detroit. Now, how, what was it like coming back to the city and... Well, being that close. I mean, I don't know the timeline. I right, only no, got so much time on the internet. I understand. So. <laughs> well, listen, so, so we're going to yeah. speed things up. Um, yeah. So I ended up working for the mayor, but it didn't quite go from me leaving the state house to working for the mayor. Okay. And not that yeah. you're implying yeah. that. Yeah. But there was this period in which I ran for mayor against I, I our city you, mayor, yeah. right? I, was, I remember you ran for mayor. That's what and I, yes. and the, the funny thing is, uh, Mayor Duggan was at my book signing a couple of weeks ago. And I was signing his book and, uh, you know, I said, you know, I'm so glad I supported you from the beginning. And he <laughs> was like, no. well, well, not the beginning, because <laughs> remember, you were beating up on me yeah. in the beginning. I said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that part. I said, but it's in the book. It's in the book. But we smoothed all that out. Right. Yeah. Um, but the importance is, you know, it's politics. Right. Yeah. Um, and in politics, there's a saying that uh, not forever friends, not forever enemies just forever yeah, issues, interest. right, and yeah. interests. And so my interest has always been in the people of the city of Detroit, recognizing that the city can't get better until the people get better. And one of the areas that I feel people have an opportunity to get better is in their understanding of financial literacy, financial education, financial empowerment, um, having the principles and tools that I began to use as a young teenager um, those, those principles never die. Principles live on forever. Yeah. And so my goal and my hope is through this book that people will, number one, recognize that um, it's not good enough to just work for money. Um, you have to let money, teach, you learn how to make money work for you. Yeah. Um, that uh, sometimes we might say, well, I only make 
X number of dollars. Well, I only had $13 when I started my candy venture yeah. and look what that had done in the end. And so there, you know, so recognizing the power of your only, um, using money as a seed and not thinking of it like it's your harvest and this is all I have, this is all I'll ever have. Um, and then last but not least, you know, paying it forward. You know, the whole ideal about becoming successful, no matter what you do, where you are, whether you're in education, in government, in business, it's about who is coming behind you. What is that generation that's coming behind you? What do they have to look forward to? And oftentimes we hear this said a lot about the generation that came before us, or maybe even our generation, in terms of how well have we prepared the next generation so that they can take our places and they, they can begin to lead. And so that's one of the things that, you know, I'd like to be able to do through this book by sharing my story, by being willing to be vulnerable and transparent and talk about some things that frankly I hadn't thought about in years. Yeah. Um, it gives insight into uh, my life so that people can possibly see themselves or see the current generation and what they're going through. Because sometimes these things repeat themselves if we don't begin to address them. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that stands out to me with you is I think that you are a testament to how financial literacy, financial knowledge, having your finances in order, especially at a younger age, gives you freedom later in life. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was tripping. You left that good corporate job to run for office, for real? Like, you're taking a pay cut to go serve in the city. You can't. You know, people's minds were blown, like, right. but you set yourself up to where you could do something from your heart. You could do, follow a passion because you weren't hemmed up or, you know, stuck because of money. Right. And I admire that and I appreciate that. And I wish that was me. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it, it, I don't think a lot of people need that lesson. And Fiotis, it's not too late. Um, sometimes we feel, oh, I've gotten to this place in my life and ah, I'll just you know, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen now. You never know what can happen until you open yourself to the possibility. That's number one. And when you talk about um, the sacrifices that I made to run for public office, even to leave the legislature, for example, when I decided to run for mayor, it was also a decision to not run for re-election to the state seat. Yeah. I could have very well done that in 2012, got elected or not gotten elected, but I set out that entire year of 2013 just to run in the campaign. Now, that was a sacrifice. I had to have resources to be able to yeah. carry me through that. I also had to have resources when I left my corporate job 17 years ago. And then in the last two years in writing this book, many people don't know this. So there was a transition, a restructuring that took place uh, during the pandemic that freed me to be able to write the book full time. There was yeah. no other financial interest that I had uh, for these past two years. And so I am solely committed. Like I am sold out to my vision, to my goals and to my calling. And I think when people recognize that, you know, there's a difference between the date that you're born and the day that you, you leave this life. And that's the dash. And we're often asked or we're often here it asks, what did you do with your dash? And so I know that I have a purpose. I know that I'm here for a reason. There are no accidents. There are no coincidences. It's all about being very intentional about what I choose to do with my life. And for me, uh, these last two years plus have been committed to sharing a story that is meant to inspire uh, not only youth, but adults, women in particular, there's so many different issues that I address in the book on top of financial literacy, um, things dealing with the family, um, things dealing with you know, the workplace, uh, situations, whether it's incarceration. Um, I talk about those topics in the book and the impact that that can have on a family. Um, and so, yeah, I, I totally put it all out there um, with the intent of helping others. Your story has always interested and fascinated me, and I'm glad to have you here. So we're going to transition to what we call our lightning round. 
Okay. This is a spot where we ask all of our guests. Uh, it's pretty much the same questions, a series of questions. There's no pressure. We just call it the lightning mm -hmm. round. It's just a term. Yep. Uh, you don't have to be like bang, bang. But um, the first question is, what's your coney order? Say that one more time. What is your coney order? When you, oh. go to, is, you are a Detroiter. <laughs> yes, yes, you yes. Are Coney, Island. Coney Island. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Everyone goes there. So I haven't um, partook in Coney Island much lately. This oh, kind of health good. thing. But I'm gonna tell you what 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 really used to get me. I used to like to get a um, a chili cheeseburger, right? So you get the burger with the chili sauce and the lettuce and tomato with mayo on it, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's a good one. Um, another one might be, you know, just a corned beef sandwich with, you know, all the trimmings. Okay. Yeah. So corned beef at a Coney Island. I, I know. keep hearing about oh. this, but okay. <laughs> uh, Fago or Verners? Verners. Okay. Who is your favorite De uh, Detroit athlete? I got to go back to the bad boy days. Um, John Sally. Okay. Uh, who, what's your favorite Detroit sports team? Detroit Lions. They kick butt. I mean, so listen, you can't be a fair weather friend, right? But you have to admire the drive, the coaching that took place over this last um, uh, season for the Detroit Lions. Like they won the last eight of ten games. Like you gotta give them credit for that. Okay. You asked. There's only so many teams in right, Detroit. You're right, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I what asked. you want? No, you're right. You're right. I'm not. Okay. Um, favorite place to go in the city? Ooh. Um, I enjoy. I don't want to sound too bougie, but I enjoy going to the Detroit Athletic Club. It's been. <laughs> Real bougie. Real bougie. Okay. I understand. Hey. And I just saw, yeah, you were there for opening day. Yes, I, I was. <laughs> I stalked you on social media. It's all good. <laughs> but listen, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Yeah. I used to be a guest of people. Um, and now you're a member? I know. It gets worse by the second. <laughs> it's okay. I aspire to be as bougie as you. <laughs> She is aspirational, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I'm just saying. She done flipped thirteen dollars in candy to a Detroit hey, Athletic Club. Come membership. on now, y'all, y'all need to get this girl's game. It, she got it, it, some. It's not cheap. <laughs> but speaking of sports, yeah. All right. So on Friday nights, right there is when there's a Tigers game. Okay. Um, they have the fireworks show at yeah. the end of the game on Friday nights. So there's no better place to be able to view that than from the rooftop. Of the uh, Detroit Athletic Club. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll have you down as a guest. Please, please, we got it on record. Please, yeah, okay. I want to go. If you're not doing anything, we go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> One of these coming Fridays, for real. <laughs> but <laughs> where can we find you? Last question is, where can we find you? So you can find me on IamLisaHouse.com. Uh, when you go to that site, I am Lisa House.com. That's I A M L I S A H O W Z E.com. You'll see my speakers reel. So I am for hire uh, as it relates to bringing personal and professional development into the workplace uh, as well as into the classroom. Also on that site, you can learn more about my book, Candy Girl Mentality. Um, currently, you could join the wait list, even though the book is out, the official uh, launch of that site where the e-commerce and all of that would be available. Um, uh, join that. And, uh, you know, I'm doing book signings, a few that are in, in the works. Um, so just follow me on social media. My handles are I am Lisa Howes on Instagram, as well as Twitter. Uh, Facebook is Lisa L. Howes. And on LinkedIn is Lisa Howes. So uh, I look forward to connecting with you, members of your audience. We got a date along with your wife down at the DAC to watch the game on a Friday night. Along with the wife. Yes. <laughs> along with the wife. Yes, she can come. She's always welcome. <laughs> Call it the right of first refusal. Right. Uh, okay. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Lisa Howes, uh, University of Michigan graduate, public servant, entrepreneur, and now author. And... Uh, Yes, please get her book, The Candy Girl Mentality. Uh, I look forward to reading it myself and providing copies for young people to learn 
how they can live their best lives and join the Detroit Athletic Club as well. <laughs> so you thank you for silly. watching the, the Distinctly Detroit podcast. Please like, rate, and review. Uh, you can get us anywhere you get your podcast, and especially Spotify for podcasts. Also, shout out to Slow's Barbecue, our sponsors. Uh, Slow's is located in uh, over on, uh, excuse me, Slow's is in Detroit in two locations, over on Cass and over on Michigan Avenue. Uh, some of the best barbecue in the city. Uh, shout out to Brian Perrone, the executive chef and owner and alum of the University of Michigan. See you all next time. Have a great one. This has been the Distinctly Detroit Podcast. This is a production of the University of Michigan Detroit Center. You can find us anywhere you get your pods. Please like, subscribe, and rate us. This podcast is executive produced by Marlon Franklin, edited by Aranza Stanton, and written by Shaylin Jones and Fiota Ship III.